Welcome back, Tribe. Today we're here with our special guest, Mark Hatmaker. Mark is a world-renowned combat sports coach, teaching boxing, wrestling, hybrid fighting, and a whole lot more. Today we're going to be specifically talking about boxing as a martial art and looking at some of the rich history and physical culture that boxing has to offer. Mark, how are you doing today? I'm doing great, sir. How about yourself? Doing well, doing well. Mark, for, for those people in the audience who may have been living under a rock for the last two decades, do me a favor and, and give us a brief introduction about yourself and you know a little bit of uh, background about you and the martial arts. Sure thing. First, they never have to be living under a rock and not know who I am, and there's, there's lives to lead. Nobody needs to keep up with that stuff. Just in a nutshell, I'm just a huge enthusiast for Western martial arts, but I get a, a big uh, a niche uh, a feeling for old-school boxing, old-school pugilism, old-school uh, wrestling, old-school grappling arts. So whenever I say Western martial arts, uh, whenever it falls into the area of, hey, you like old sword play and all this, you go, oh, I admire it, but that's not my bailiwick. I know nothing about that. So we don't make any claims there. But if it's as far as uh, closing the hands up, throwing some punches, throwing some elbows, the old school way, or even some of the new school boxing way, or you know, look at the way uh, the, the wrestling game, whether it's the now beautiful cleaned up version that's incredibly athletic, all the way back to the beginning of time, all of that's good to me. That's the kind of stuff that sends my soul. Been studying it for a long, long, long time. And if I have any gift for this, which is that's debatable, is uh, I think just being somewhat of an archaeologist with it and maybe being a good synthesizer of, uh, of information. Now, Mark, we're going to talk about boxing. And, and like you just mentioned, there's a, a modern cleaned up version of boxing. But a lot sure. of people in our community, when they think of boxing, that's what they think about. And I think a lot of times, just for lack of exposure or lack of research, they – are not aware that there's a, a, an entirely different martial tradition when it comes to boxing. Dating mm -hmm. back, you know, very far. I mean, you could go back as far as pretty much any culture in the world has kind of developed fisticuffs in a way of fighting with the hands. But, you know, going back through, you know, the ancient Greeks, you know, they, they boxed and, you know, up until, you know, more recent history in Europe, where do you begin your, your study of boxing? What era is the era that you focused on initially? You know, initially what led me into it was uh, my grandfather, who uh, he, for a while, was a coal miner in, in Virginia. And I remember he always had, instead of a heavy bag in lieu of that, he had just an old duffel bag that he had sand-filled and rag-filled that was hanging up in his barn. And that's where we first started just learning, uh, learning some shots, whether it was the boxing or the wrestling. And he just called it scuffling. So it began just sort of... Uh, Kids trying to, uh, me and my cousins trying to be as badass as we thought, uh, uh, my grandfather was. He was a st strong, strong human being. And then, uh, you know, later on, uh, you know, the interest stayed to go, well, what's, what's behind this madness? What else is going on? Trying to, uh, probably get a little bit too nitpicky with the details. I wanted to, you know, look more into the history, more into the technique. So it, it just began with just kind of like a hero worship of a grandfather. Moving on from that into the history, and uh, be, be honest with you, you can assert me anywhere in the boxing chain, and I'm a fan of all of them, whatever is occurring in the sport now, and then you can go, hey, let's talk night boxing 1983. I'm all about it. Let's talk boxing 1970. Let's do it. Let's talk boxing 1868. Sure thing. And like you said, let's go all the way back to the Pancratian or Pancratian tradition. All about it. So anywhere where that fist is being thrown, uh, and as you mentioned, a lot of people aren't aware that there's lots of shots that get – were dropped out to clean the sport up. You know, there was there was elbows thrown, there was stiff arming thrown. Hell, it used to be legal to actually gouge in the throat and shove people in the turnbuckle. You can use a cross buttock throw. There was lots of things that were legal and lots of little shots that were definitely not legal, but were pretty much used uh, as common parlance, uh, particularly from the eras running from around, let's say, 1890-ish all the way through the 30s. And then there's still some dirty fighting going on after that, but you had to hide it a lot better because TV made them, uh, referees really had to clamp down and clean that up to some degree. Now, I became initially a fan of boxing, and it's it's actually pretty ironic. I, I discovered about six months after I moved from a childhood home that the the neighbor across the street actually was a pretty well-renowned amateur coach and actually had an entire gym in a, in a extended garage in his backyard. And I lived across the street from this guy for years and never knew it. I was reading books on boxing and, you know, <laughs> traveling on the bus to try to get to gyms uh, to, you know, try boxing was when I was a teenager. And, you know, my initially I started to, and I guess maybe in this sense I was lucky, but I came across authors like, and I'm sure you're familiar with some of their books, um, 
you know, guys like uh, Champ Thomas and oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, and Robert, you know, Robert Gil- uh, Gibley, you know, they they wrote about a different era of boxing, and you right. know, I, I got you know a little bit of exposure, you know, conceptually to some of the things that they were talking about. I never saw it in practice, I and mean, what I had access to was modern sport boxing. But you mentioned a lot of things there, and I think that those things in particular are what help round out sport boxing today into a more martial system that can be used for self-defense. So can mm-hmm. you tell me about how you began to, you know, incorporate those those additional techniques and, and how you systemize them into a, a program for training for today? Sure. Well, we can attempt to shift through that. In a sense, uh, from uh, the beginning of uh, the scuffling period forward, I, it always been a little bit of a mix uh, that we had. We uh, I never quite uh, we never quite really dipped our toe into where it was pure boxing. Uh, I, I was fortunate enough for uh, to there was always a little bit of illegal shots going on there. Whether we're talking court uh, court school punches, not necessarily illegal, but. Um, uh, 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 the scissors punch from uh, battling Nelson. We always had that sort of thing mixed in. Now, uh, I think even the cleaned up sport version today, I think, is uh, could be a devastating self defense martial art in and of itself. I mean, if we get rid of the whole, hey, you're going to bust your hands in someone's head, arguing aside, yes, of course you can, but we're all going to get hurt if we're actually down in a, a street fight. There's no doubt about it. And if anyone doubts that even the sportive version of today, 21st century boxing, is a martial art, I just say, well, you've not faced a good boxer. Just go in there and, you know, Find yourself a kid who's young and hungry from Golden Gloves, and then tell him, uh, you know, do his thing while you do your thing. If he if he gets his hands on you, there's there's going to be a problem, and you're gonna, we're going to have a lot of respect for it. I think everyone probably already sees uh, the wisdom of that. It it definitely gets to be a different sort of uh, 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 sting in the tail when we start throwing in the way the elbow shots were thrown as inserts. We start throwing some backhand blows. Uh, the pivot punching, which is basically, if you think of a spinning back fist, but it's not a back fist thing whatsoever. It's thrown up kind of with a different setup, set up with something called a duelist jab. Um, uh, there's these, these hacksaw shots. There's, uh, there's different ways to, uh, uh, there's some interesting foot stomps that really so much about, not the Marco Hua style from the early UFCs where you're looking to bust the metatarsals, so much as trying to pin the foot while you're throwing your shot to bust the ligaments in that ankle. So you're taking away uh, the guy's footwork. I mean, it's just a whole new brand of evil where, yes, it's all fist-centric, but these other little inserts uh, inserts, uh, thrown on top of it are just mean to uh, open you up to make those uh, fists do their job a little bit more. Uh, Does that make sense? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, Mark, let me ask you just a a historical question to kind of put things in in context here. Sure. There was a time in the United States and and in Europe, uh, arguably around the world, but especially in Europe and the United States, that boxing was the art of self-defense. I have got a lot of old manuals where boxing is not mm-hmm. referred to as a sport. It's referred to as the art of self-defense. Right. Where did we, you know, as as Americans, I think we've kind of lost touch with a lot of our martial culture, you know, what we brought over mm-hmm. from Europe. But where was the decline in boxing as a, as a martial art and as an art of self-defense? And... What was the cause of it? What what happened? That you know, no that is a fantastic question, and everything I say here is just my best guess as to what's going on. Because you're absolutely right. In the beginning, it was so often referred to the manly art of self defense, and the same thing goes with the old school wrestling. I think there's a few uh, uh, cultural pressures that came in to make this transition. Uh, one, I think, being um, as uh, I'm not slagging off the entire 21st century culture because I'm part of it as well, but there's to some degree of softening that goes on. I think any of us looks at what workloads used to be for people, what people used to do for a living all the time. There's some people still out there who who are steeplejacks and uh, doing hard the hard lifting of, of keeping the, the infrastructure alive, but there used to be more jobs along those lines. There was more people involved in the rough and tumble and hardcore sort of thing. And uh, some of the... Like we look at the early versions of football, even we see if this is a harder game. And then we, uh, one reason we see so many concussions now is we know because it's partly a side effect of having a better safety gear. I mean, people are spearing with the helmets just because the helmets are made so much better. And you know, early football, you know, no helmet, people are just kind of like avoiding the spearing, but still a rough and tumble version of the game. I just think uh, the rougher version of boxing and it being a self defense was part and parcel of being the side mix of how the culture was a little bit. Uh, tough or a little bit more robustifying, if you will. Um, so I think it's we've gotten a bit 
uh, the word pro am saying, as we saw from up, is probably uh, that damns us too much, but it's 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 not too far off the mark there. It's uh, just as we see. I think the next pressure that kind of comes in is when we see following World War II, we're we're getting some veterans coming back and they're bringing in some of the original hard style of Asian martial arts, whether it be uh, karate, what have you. Where I have no doubt some of the earlier versions were coming in a bit more pure and a bit harder. The more things go on, the more market pressures mean that people need to make money or want to make money. Uh, we all want to. So they start watering the market down where, and again, this isn't sliding off anyone who's running you know, a strip market, uh, uh, a strip uh, mall dojo. But as we know, if you want to make money, you're going to have to have a big kids program and you're going to have to have a cardio kickbox program. You're not necessarily going to be making all your prime cash off of the hardcore version of kickboxing. The same thing if you go into, there's very few pure MMA gyms. They have to survive off of some of these tangential programs. The women's cardio kickbox program is going to be way bigger than the MMA uh, program. But if we look at early boxing gyms and early wrestling gyms, there's just no evidence whatsoever of these watered down versions. Everyone just took it as being, you know, part and parcel of it being, oh, it's a tough sport, it's a contact sport, you know, you know, you're going to pull up your panties to get in there and do this. Does that kind of make sense? Absolutely. Absolutely, it does. Now, Mark, let me ask you this. The the transition from the bare knuckle to the gloved era of boxing, uh, I want mm-hmm. to ask you kind of a twofold question on that. One, did just kind of keeping with the, the, the line of thought we just had, do you believe that that contributed to boxing not continuing as a self-defense art? And number two, my question is more on the mechanical level. I wanted to know if you could give us some thoughts on how boxing changed with the advent of gloves. Okay, great. Again, great questions. Good on you. Um, Yeah, I would say moving into the glove era probably helped change the perception that uh, these mufflers in the hands, since it was was supposed to create something, they're thinking a safer environment. Really, it's more along the lines of let's have less cutting so we can keep the mayhem going on longer. And that was, again, a market pressure. It's uh, promoters trying to keep the fight going on longer. So that's to some degree. It has little to do. I mean, it's a, it's a sound good reason of going, we're trying to protect the fighters. And not really. Uh, they're trying to make sure this lasts longer. The same thing with this we see with the NFL situation there with the helmets. We are all aware that actually if you back off on the helmet technology, it's a little safer for the players, but it's not nearly as good for the audience and the market. So it's a while it may be well before the NFL backs off on that, but maybe they won't even do it because, you know, they're still they're raking in the money, so that's the way it works. Um, you're probably correct that some people perceive that glove on the hand as being uh, moving it closer and closer to sport, but I'm not quite – we're not really seeing it still drop out of being referred to as a self-defense. Uh, there are maybe – that 40s to the 50s, that transition where people were regarding it less and less as being uh, street utility. I mean, it didn't completely fall out that way, but there is to some degree that occurs. I have to forgive me there. I forgot the second part of your question. Could you refresh me, please? Well, the second part of my question was just more on a mechanical level. I wanted to know if you could mm-hmm. explain to us how the mechanics of of the art changed. Oh, abso- oh absolutely. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, you know, I said it was a good question. It still is a good question. I just forgot it. Uh, part of it would be the fact that, you know, once we have the technology of the glove to play, sure, more things uh, uh, the hand is able to take more repeated blows. So we're able to you know, stick that jab out there with a lot more alacrity on it. We're able to throw that rear hand with a lot more shot on it, uh, a lot more stink on it. When you look at some of the early bare knuckle stuff, lots of times you're going to see this long arm extended out. And that extension there that can look curious to us is where the jab was less of a technology because you thought some of these things could be going on for you know hours at a time and you're trying to save that hand. A lot of that was being treated as like a it's a long pole axer. So keep away from me until you can really wind up and throw that hand. And often when that hand's being thrown, some of these uh, 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 shots are coming in, not necessarily as, a, even though the fist is closed, more of a chopping shot. You can think of a, an odd mixture between a, uh, a standard uh, a shooto standard karate chop and a little bit of a, uh, a downward inward slapping motion. The fist would still be closed to give it some a little bit of weight and inertia behind it. But uh, these these old fighters weren't idiots. They were protecting their hands to some degree. And once we we put the glove on the fist, and also the thicker the glove gets, the boxers start behaving just as like today's NFL players do. They realize, well, how do we take a so-called safer piece of technology 
and then still make it even more uh, det- uh, more detrimental to the person standing in front of me. So, yeah, the technique alters every time we throw a new safety thing in way. We're going to find a way to exploit that, even though it's meant to make something safer on the face of it. Uh, often that's not the case, as we know there's more ring deaths uh, now just simply because you're able to take repeated concussions, and that's that's where the problem comes into play. The same thing with the NFL. There's a greater chance for the Parkinson's disease by taking so many shots as opposed to just the straight bare-knuckle error, we know, the cut or the immediate slowing that closes up the eye will get you out of that fight far sooner. Even though some of these things were going for many rounds, we have to keep in mind some of this would be like along Tommy Laughlin style, keeping people off, playing a smarter game. There's a greater amount of uh, like care given to footwork and facility, uh, uh, beautiful, artful work, because people are just trying to, you know, protect themselves where now the gloves can can protect to some degree. We don't have to be as crafty. It might be given a little bit less weight where punching power has to go through the roof because it's harder to draw people with, uh, with that glove on the fist. Now, Mark, let me ask you, because I think that you're in a good position to answer this type of question. I've heard the argument, and I believe that it's an argument made with flawed logic, that, you know, martial arts need to evolve, that everything is constantly changing, that technology, you know, is changing. And I get that argument a lot. I think I may have seen it in reference to, um, you know, muskets and rifles. People say, well, you don't, you know, nowadays we use uh, an AK-47 or an AR. We don't use, you know, uh, old muskets anymore. Right. And I think right. that there's a, a flaw in that logic because that's external uh that's external technology. The human body has not changed in, in, Agreed. in generation. Agreed. I'm no. hundred percent with you that there's only so many ways to throw hands and feet and elbows. There's only so many ways to twist and uh, twist and crank uh, once you get down on the ground. We're, uh, you said this is all a technological uh, uh, adaptation. We don't look at a horse and buggy. We don't look at a, a, a Model T Ford. We don't look at the, the vehicles today. We don't look at a space shuttle. Uh, we don't look at it, uh, 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 Virgin Airlines and expect all these things. Uh, to say this, and we realize technology will move on, where the human body is going to is going to need you know millennia more a bit of uh, ev- evolutionary development to see what else might happen. But it's going to be going to be long dead, the U N I at least, or the entire species before anything else changes enough to significantly affect the way that we throw our hands. And that relates to the the analogy that I've heard people will say, well, you know, everything has to evolve. Look at boxing, and they always throw boxing out as you know, the prime example of evolution, and they almost do it with a mocking tone, um, almost almost condescending regarding the, the old bare-knuckle boxers. For mm-hmm. In your research, as far as, you know, the, the just the pure aspect of self-defense, not sport boxing, mm-hmm. give me, you know, what the pros and cons are to the modern version of boxing as opposed to the bare-knuckle. Because from reading your books and, and viewing your materials, I can see that there's a great appreciation for that older style. And again, I think that the logic of newer is better is not necessarily true. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I'm with you. I think, uh, I like to think of what we do here, uh, is, as being a bit of a half breed, meaning we're, we're standing at two different time periods and trying to hopefully, optimally mixing the best of the two. I think where there might be a difference between, uh, yesterday's fighters and today's, uh, speaking metaphorically, of course, today's, Fighters are have access to so much more uh, uh, wiser training on the athleticism side of the thing. I mean, seeing an athlete like Evander Holyfield, this is almost practically unheard of in, in, in the early days. When we look at who some of the biggest fighters and their measurements of that time, we look at these are people who look just like well, me and you, everyone at walk around way. So the advances in athleticism, the advances in that sort of training, that's huge. I mean, abs- absolutely a game changer in that sense. Now, what might be different where, uh, to some degree, I think now there might be an overload, not, this is, this is a broad statement, not a condemnation. There might be an overload on creating that athletic monster and a little bit less on the skill side where initially it was more built along the lines of what are the absolute skills we can create as well as a, a good amount of grit. Because when we look at the early records of even champs now, I mean, it's just, it's almost, it's unheard of to have people taking this many fights. There's people who are taking you know, a fight a, a week is not uncommon. There's, there's, I've got so many things in my files of guys doing three, four fights a night, and this is absolutely an, an insane 
work rate. You've got people who are doing at least the minimum three, four uh, fights a month. And some of, this, some of these cases is it, are champions taking at least a, a fight a month. And this is up through uh, the 40s. So we've got people who are retiring with records, even keep in mind, not all the fights are on the books with, you know, you know, hundreds of fights to it. Now, if we see a fighter who retires now at the end of a lifelong successful career, if he's broken 40, that's almost astonishing. So I think to some degree, there is so much more going on, so much experience with the grit, the stick to and really learning that craft. Uh, we know that breaking the body down, as some of today's uh, athleticism training does, I think that's the difference. We get, we can find, we get to have the benefit of going, hey, let's use some of the, the new advances in uh, conditioning training, but let's not forget what was going on and considered crafty and absolutely essential to keep yourself safe with this huge work rate. Uh, you know, fight to rest ratio. Now, Mark, let me ask you this. This is a topic that I've touched on with a few of my friends just kind of in private conversation. But there comes a point where I think a lot of instructors will kind of reach a crossroads in their in their training and in their understanding. And what I can kind of identify is the two routes. And I, I think that you fall into one of these very clearly is either borrow more or understand more. And what I mean by that is that I think, you know, I've seen people get to a point in their martial art where they understand their, you know, their home martial art or their original art to a, to a point, and then they kind of start looking for other answers to, you know, questions that keep coming up in their training, and they begin to borrow. And I hear a lot of guys that will tell me, you know, I, oh, yeah, you know, we do uh, Ishinru Karate, but we, you know, we also train in jujitsu for this and in Kali to handle this, you know, scenario. And then I, I run across instructors that don't necessarily borrow, but I mean, they may, you know, but, but their focus is more on finding solutions within the parameters of their art and just finding mm -hmm. a deeper understanding. I, I feel that you have a much better understanding of boxing than the average person does for self-defense. What are your thoughts on that? Have you found the solutions that you needed within the framework of boxing, or did you find that you needed to borrow? And speaking specifically you know, of, like, the stand-up game, because obviously grappling is a different animal. But sure. give me your thoughts on that. You know, that, okay, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question. The answer, I don't know if this will sound nuanced or if it's a hedged answer, in the sense that, yeah, we'll occasionally go through times that I will foolishly think to myself, well, well that's it. What else uh, can you do? Uh, I mean, what else is there to say and look at? And then, uh, but fortunately, whether it's just the history of these twin sports that I love so well, boxing and wrestling, that I, I'm almost incessantly trying to, uh, to look at, I, I just a big, you know, frontier history in the United States and Canada uh, in particular, a uh, huge buff for this sort of thing. And then I'll find something new that is seems only tangentially re related. Like, uh, I mean, I'm I'm this boring guy who, if I come across in an antique shop. Uh, 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 an 1860 something book on logging. I'll read that just because it's a time period that fascinates me. And then lo and behold, you'll find something in there about some uh, anecdotal account about uh, the way the, uh, the loggers would scuffle and some of the things that uh, uh, the way they would talk about throwing uh, throwing corks in, uh, and which was the referring to the uh, the spikes that were on their shoes. And they go, oh, that's fascinating. You find a whole new way to perhaps illuminate a, a box in your resting detail that you're aware of from some previous research. And all of a sudden you go, ah, oh, now I understand this, 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 and they start looping together. There's some sort of like these these odd serendipitous moments from outside historical research. So I still find just the boxing and the wrestling itself eternally fascinating and trying to find answers within that. But I find myself looking outside of them, but not at other martial arts so much as just other historical accounts. And then I'm reading them just for the sake of the, them being accounts of, of history, but occasionally something pops up to go, aha, like I've got a, an unusual hobby I picked up two years ago. I'm attempting to learn uh, the Comanche uh, language, the Comanche Indian language. There's just no point beyond the fact I found an old manual in an antique shop, and I'd always been fascinated with, I wanted to learn the language of uh, a culture that I, had, I associated with being a warrior culture. There's many good examples, but that's the one that hit for me. And the deeper I learn this language, more resources become available to me that weren't before, just simply by the fact I'm able to read and understand them. And even within that, there's more things that come out about early frontier fighting that I never would have had my eyes open to by simply the fact that I, I didn't understand what I was seeing on the page. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. It's very interesting. 
Now, Mark, let me ask you, as a student, because you have trained in martial arts other than boxing and wrestling. Um, yes. Just, just for you know, the sake of comparing and contrasting, have you looked at other boxing methods? Uh, you know, Filipino panatukin or Muay Thai. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I, actually, the thing is, I, I've looked at so many, and I'm a big fan of so so much outside of what I do. But I also am painfully aware of where my uh, attentional limitations are. I find that if I get too di- diffuse, exactly one of the things you're talking about, looking outside of what you do, I'm saying for me, I don't think this is necessarily a problem for others. If I look too, if I start looking at too much outside of what I do, I find that uh, what I do, I find that if I work on, let's say if I'm going to go full bore into uh, my Muay Thai studies, which I did for a while, just because I, yeah, I love it. It's a fantastic sport. I've got some fantastic friends in it who were great, and I, I've had a, reached a great deal of benefit of working with them. But then I find on my straight boxing, at least the historical boxing stuff, that would suffer a bit. Uh, and that's probably, it probably mentions more my a- athleticism than being able to, to handle the workload. It's just you know, the, the, the timing and the, uh, the dynamics are a bit different from one to the other. So I find rather than being, my, this is a horribly inept comparison because, you know, I'm Michael Jordan, a fantastic athlete. And good Lord, I am not that. But we see him playing, uh, basketball and we watch him playing baseball. And I think, you know, keep playing basketball. I think how a lot of us felt. We know he was doing something he enjoyed, but we thought we're not nearly as, as good over here. So I find it's best for me, every time I start splitting my focus too much, I start going, eh, I'll come back here. But if your question is how do they stack up and how do they compare, I, the proof is always in what uh, that practitioner and our instructor is able to throw out there. And if it's if it's gorgeous and it works, use it. I mean, just because I love boxing and wrestling, there's never any uh, – tacit or implicit, you know, it's because it's the best. It's never that. It's just what's best to me. It's the thing that floats my boat and keeps me alive, and I just, I love doing it. And there's going to be far better resources in those other outside tangential arts and sports you discussed. I said, yeah, run and look to them. I'm not going to try and be a, a jack of all trades with this stuff. I mean, I don't even think I understand what I'm doing well enough. So, and hell, I'm 50 years old. I'm, right now, I feel like, yeah, sure, it is. I mean, I think we just put a book, uh, dropped a book out on uh, uh, Bossing Like the Champs, which is it's the most fun I've had writing a book in a long time simply because it woke me back up. I mean, I've been doing this for so long, but it reminded me of so much stuff that was in my notes that i not sure I understood completely and maybe had a superficial understanding from decades of work, but maybe further down the road at this half a century on the planet and the other resources at play, more and more things are starting to make sense. So I find there's more than enough material here to keep my mind wrapped up and involved for a bit. Now, Mark, your your system of boxing, I would – it lends – Hold on. You're, you're, you're really low right now. I can barely hear you. Okay. Mark, so your system of boxing lends itself very mm-hmm. well to street self-defense. What about the world of mixed martial arts? How have you, you know, have you trained mixed martial arts fighters? Are you, you know, having people oh, yeah. that are taking your your methods and incorporating it into the mixed martial arts? Yeah, yes, we do. What we do when we do, um, we'll have in a, we don't run a team. What we'll do is we'll spot check or do boot camps with fighters, and, and they'll come through and all we do is say, hey, here's. Here's our method and the way this works. Uh, and since we know we're working boxing and often what they're going to be versus, uh, having to face is both they're going to be looking at people throwing hands, which are, hey, we're more than equipped to show you how to do that. And we're also looking at people who are looking to shoot the take down or can control the clinch. Boom, we got you covered there. And we're also, they're looking at people who got the kick coming in. Now, I do not claim any facility in being that guy who throws the kick. But what we do understand about it is uh, that was one of the reasons to work with Ty long enough to go, uh, you got to fear this weapon. This is an awesome thing coming at you. So when we, we will alter. So if we're just running a straight boxing program, uh, obviously we're going to, it's going to hew far more closely to what you see in 21st century sport boxing. And then we're going to have to give you a nice overlay of some of that nice tricky stuff that was used by the early guys. If we're doing our street work, it's going to look a lot less, maybe, maybe only surface like the 21st 
uh, century version of boxing, probably more like a 1920s or 30s version, and then lots of hidden little mean shots in it. If we're doing the boxing for MMA, then we're doing things way differently. We're changing the stance, we're biting down on the footwork, and we're also altering the way we're running the lead hand and the, our power size we're running to or running for uh, so we can control, uh, well, help control that that uh, what's going to happen from that kick or what's going to happen from that takedown. It's very much the way the late but great coach Sean Tompkins used to do. Now, Mark, regarding the, the mixed martial arts, you have a very integrated approach to the boxing and, and to the wrestling. Mm-hmm. What what are your thoughts in general with the just the general state of MMA? And, and not naming anybody in particular, but how do you feel mm-hmm. people are doing with, with blending the the stand up and the grappling arts you know because i remember this is back in the early days of mixed martial arts in the united states you had guys that you know maybe had good wrestling experience maybe mm-hmm. had some good boxing experience but they kind of lost something in the transition yeah oh um, great observation uh that's i would have said the exact same thing but you still have my answer so uh, you're right. You can see in the early days, you can watch people shift gears. You go, here's the thing I know well, and here's the thing they taught me to not get my ass kicked in case this happened. And you can definitely see that transition work. You can, it's, uh, and probably not a, a wise transition, but it's an understandable one, uh, in the beginning. It, it looked very much like someone's playing soccer and they go, quick, here's a basketball, you know, sh- shoot a goal. I'm like, huh? And then it, it looked very clumsy. But what we have now, is uh, it's just astonishing the growth of ability. Because initially what we had was, no matter what the art was, it's someone who was very, very good at a single or two modes of operation at best. They were very good at that. And the other things, just as you said, the transitions could look clumsy, or in some cases they just didn't even exist. Now, we, when we think about it, we have athletes, we have kids who can take MMA classes, who've never taken a strip mall taekwondo class or never actually been to a boxing gym. They've been doing just MMA as a sport uh, since they were young. I mean, they're pretty much MMA is their little league. So some of the finest people we're seeing out there right now are some young bucks who didn't have to learn how to make transitions. They were having the whole enchilada thrown in at the same time. So I think to a large degree, we're seeing our best incarnation of a truly mixed martial artist, where before you could see the mix was like, yeah, you get two things down. These other two elements look a little iffy. Not to say everyone's great across all spectrums, but it's increasingly the case where everyone looks pretty damn, pretty damn good. Because even now, I, in my opinion, I think what you're seeing in some undercard fights is superior to what we used to see in some main card fights. I don't know if that's uh, anathema to some people out there, but I think it just seems to be a fact. I mean, that's no disrespect to some of the pioneers you got out there, but some undercard guys are just so amazingly well blended and so athletic. It's uh, I'd be hard pressed to go, man. That's, what do you do against that if you're stuck in only two gears? Mark, let me ask you about some of the projects that you do related to the teaching that are not done in the classroom. Sure. You, ha- you have a, a, a library uh, which I, I would be challenged to find anybody that's produced as much instructional <laughs> material as you do, <clears throat> and, and and I applaud you for it, and I'm impressed by it because I you know I know very few people that could even come close to having that much creativity and and research done where they could do something like that. You're, you're putting that in a kind way. It could be I'm long-witted and full of shit. I like to think it's like I'm constantly – I appreciate it. I really do. I like to think it's because we're constantly looking at new material, and I'm still excited about what we do here. And, uh, hey, here's a brand-new way to look at it. I have to be honest with you. Some of the material we do is uh, revision or telling people, hey, I was wrong. You know, this was great technology uh, 10 – a decade ago, but now not so much. I'm sorry. I cut you off there, but – No, no, it's fine. The, and, and that's a very – that's a very honest approach. Um, you know, it's actually very refreshing to find an instructor that can, you know, tell their students, I've grown, so now you should grow. But the the question I have for you here is is first about your books, because mm-hmm. I, I want to get your perspective on what that experience was like writing. I have spoken to a few mm-hmm. martial arts authors, and I hear a lot of interesting things from them as far as, you know, their own personal growth and how that writing process helps them. Tell me about your process, writing your books on boxing and wrestling, and what did it bring to you? How was it beneficial to you? Oh, uh, okay, good question, but this might be a boring answer in the sense as we've seen in some of the answers I've just given in this interview, 
I'm probably over talking. I just I can't shut the hell up. I just I I'm going to keep running whether I got to say uh, I've got something to say or not. And to some degree, uh, but honestly, I'm speaking my truth. Whatever I think that the truth is to me right now, I'm saying it. And we do the same thing on the page. Um, to be honest with you, whether I had the books or not, I would have I would have written that material. I just dig getting because before I was even putting the books out there. Uh, I, I'm sure just like yourself or anyone I think just loves what they do. The notes were copious and endless stacks and stacks of notebooks, whether it's handwritten, scrawl, keyed in things way before I even knew what a computer was or a word processor, just material everywhere. So the written word is just, uh, uh, um, I, that's the, it's an easy part for me. I don't mean, I'm not, that sounds like a humble brag. I don't mean that to be the case. I like what I do. I like the information we're talking about. And yes, it is work. Don't get me wrong. Everything's work. You know, you get a blank page and what are we going to do here? But as far as there being some big transformative experience, no, if anything, it may help um, better codify, hey, this detail needs to be said. I can't show the detail. How do I make sure I've got a certain structure or an ABC linear pragmatic approach that hopefully can translate to you being able to do this if I never get to meet you face to face? Was that a sufficient answer? Or did I just get off track there? No, no, that's great. You know, one thing I wanted to ask you because it, it was an experience for me when I was, you know, trying to put some of my ideas to paper. I, mm -hmm. And this may sound bizarre, but I realized there were times when I came to the realization in having to write it for the purpose of instructing somebody else that mm -hmm. I realized that my understanding of that particular you know technique or, or concept was not really where it should have been. And I kind of learned from you know just trying to teach other people, and I, I educated myself, and, and I looked at the page and go, oh, okay, I get it, like, you know, I thought it was like this, but now that I'm trying to explain no. it to somebody else, I, I kind of have a different understanding of it. No, that's a completely valid observation. So I think I'm keying into what you're, you're saying now. I, I think anyone who does a boot camp or a seminar with me will hear this phrase out of my mouth uh, at least um, three, four times in a, in a four-hour period. Oh, hold on, guys. That, that was shitty instruction from Mark. Meaning that uh, seeing a technique try to be expressed, a new tactic being expressed through somebody else's fresh eyes or fresh body approach to it lets me know, oh, I need to revise how I'm showing this. Something that seems uh, duh to me may not be to someone else. And it, and I don't mean that in the sense, oh, they're stupid. Why can't they have my gifts? I don't mean that. I just mean that, oh, I you know, I forgot to say, you know. Put your thumb there, and that was the that was the most important thing about it. So, yeah, perhaps, probably to, to some degree, I think probably with the books, what is helpful for me is I don't put anything on the page that because um, you know, just like the, the Western martial arts, I think one of the things where we say we're looking at Western empiricism as well. We call it the ring or the mat. It's the laboratory. Everything should be. It's not dogma. It's, let's try it. Let's test it. Let's see if this hurts. I mean, I, I mean. <laughs> I've lost a tooth recently over this, over this stupid stuff. It's uh, it's what we do to test things out, and it's uh, so we always say it's kind of like a ring tested, met tempered. You got to roll it around, and make and it can't just work once. It's got to work many times, and it just can't work for me. It's got to work for different body class, I mean uh, weight classes, and it's got to work for the female athletes as well as the male athletes, and vice versa. We got something that's too much of a Gumby move, meaning you know flexibility, and it's only going to work in 80 to uh, 80 20 percent, meaning like well 80 percent of us. Camp, but this super gifted guy can. We try and strip that sort of thing out of the system. It doesn't mean such a thing as a dumb idea for everyone else. If you're that gifted Gumby person, or you got super phenomenal speed, you know, jump on it. But everything we do is really pushed hard, and so it's done here in the lab. And then we take it out in the road with the boots and the seminars, and the same thing. We look at that. So by the time it gets to the page, hopefully that's been already like a first, second, third, and fourth draft period where we kind of understand what we might be encountering and hopefully make it clear as we can be with the written word. That makes sense? Yes, yes, absolutely. Now, Mark, we, we've we talked offline and, and we've agreed to come back and, and visit this theme, uh, you know, at another time because I, I, sure. I feel like uh, there's so much to talk to you about that I don't want to try to get too much in in one conversation and I would like to, you know, stick to the boxing. But it, it does relate because I when, when I was growing up, there was a... a a sense of sportsmanship with the boxing. And I think that it's a mm -hmm. critique that comes from 
you know, martial artists that are, are training in, uh, you know, primarily Asian martial arts, and they'll often say, you know, well, boxing has no code of honor. Boxing has no code of conduct. It's just fighting. Mm-hmm. It's just, you know, getting out there and, and throwing fists. And mm-hmm. I always found that to be kind of a, a, a cop-out answer because, and not just with boxing, but with any sport, you know, there was an old-fashioned sense of, you know, fair play and sportsmanship that did translate to character development. And I'm sure you can find plenty of people that have had only boxing in their in their lives as an influence that would tell you boxing made them better people. Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I, I would agree with, I would completely disagree with the, uh, whoever would, with the aspersion that, yeah, boxing, yeah, it doesn't honor and respect and all this. Completely disagree. But I think we're going to find any physical or, or endeavor that calls for hardihood and grit and uh, working with the team, because that's even if you're walking across from someone, you're you're there in the same gym with other people, and if you if you know you have the opportunity to stand before these people, and they're going to show you where your mistakes are, and you're going to do the like favor for them. These are some of the, my best friends in the entire world, and this is a whole for boxing. It's been for wrestling. Anyone I ever spoken with who's from Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, anything, anyone who's doing something in a truly contact related way, not something that has a hands off way. I actually find it reversed. Anything that takes too much care and too much, uh, 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 uh fealty to dogma. We do it this way and that's it. Of course, I wouldn't do this to you because you know you would die. And they go, well, that's, that's not science, and it also it, it creates a bit of doubt, and maybe sometimes you have to protect that doubt with a little bit of attitude. If does that make sense? What I'm saying, where yeah, with yeah. boxing and wrestling, once you hit it and you're really hitting each other and rolling, the truth comes out, and it's hard to stay cocky whenever someone is like, "Oh, you cranked me on that one. Way to go, brother!" And oh man, that liver shot sucks like a mother. And then you you've got to have some appreciation. You can't walk off and you know pout and look. Can't believe you punched me. Hell, it's boxing. He's supposed to punch you. That's his job. He's your best training partner right then when he finds the hole. And I always find it creates this huge mutual respect. That's the one that burns so much energy. By the time you get out in the real world, you're either worn out or you're like, man, this ain't worth fighting about. I don't want to do this stuff. I think I've already I've blown it all out here in the gym. I'm okay. I'm a, I'm a I'm a happy guy. Right now, <clears throat> Mark. Specifically with with uh, that aspect of training, the, you know the tribe, the Raven tribe, is is focused on developing warriorship as a lifestyle, not just as you know martial arts you go to do in the dojo or you know self defense techniques that you learn to you know fight off a mugger. And right. you, you've touched a lot on that already, but you have a, a project that is the the Valet Alliance, and mm-hmm. that seems to be very much uh, kind of a kindred spirit to what we attempt to do with the tribe. Tell me a little bit about the alliance and what the goals are and what you're trying to instill in the people that you're training. No, oh, uh, thank you for asking that. Um, also, like, as you already said, and I think we said before we started this, you and I have discussed before, I love what you are trying to do w- with uh, the group, where you're telling people it's just not about the physical aspects of it. You are trying to say, hey, what's good? If, you may be a good boxer. You may be a good wrestler. You may be good this or that. But what does it mean? It means more to be a good man, a good woman, a good person on the planet. I'm not just talking in the whole being the charitable sense, just walking around, being the best you can be, an, an exemplar. And uh, and I think that's what you're doing w- with your group. Our small group here, it's it called the Veili Alliance. It just comes from the Latin word Veili, which it used to be a closing salutation to uh, letters among certain uh, Roman, not just the nobles, but many, particularly those from the Stoic tradition. And Veili basically means be well, be strong, be worthy. It was a way to say, it wasn't just meant to be, hey, take it easy, man, have a good one. It was reminding you to be strong and worthy, not in the sense of uh, uh, chin held high, look, I'm better than you. It meant to be worthy. You can, like, earn this life. This is the one you got. Do it right. And everything you do, try and walk as you can. So we mean that in the training. Bring what you got to the gym. You want to you know, work hard there, but the same thing, it's not done. You walk with it outside of it. And I'm at, through the historical studies, I'm absolutely fascinated by that sense of camaraderie and tribal relationship inside that. And then still make sure it's just not that. Be something stronger in everyday life. Uh, the folks in the Bailey Alliance that um, are working with these people, whether it's in the boot camp, seminar, the one-on-one situation, but I have so many wonderful friends. Chris Yatskovich comes to mind, James Marsh, Dan Marsh. I could just name tons. Hell, it sounds like me and you. You sound like a kindred spirit to me. I've got so many wonderful times on the mat 
or in the gym with these guys, but I think I might treasure even more, and they may disagree. I call them the back deck conversations. I know Chris Joskovich and I have spent many an hour sitting on his back porch or back deck in Montreal doing nothing but uh, sipping some fine adult beverages and discussing things that have zero to do with hurting people whatsoever. I mean, no punching, no kicking, no wrestling, no nothing. And that's two people who love the games dearly, but it's all about uh, maybe some of the bigger things of character in life and, you know, hey, what's the right thing to do? So I think... I think I'm preaching to the choir with you. I think you're doing the exact same thing with your work. Well, Mark, before we wrap up for today, I want you to take a moment and tell the audience where they can find your products, where, if they're interested in going to one of the boot camps, if they're interested in becoming affiliates uh, and learning some of your programs. How can people reach out to you, and what can they you know, expect to get from right. Well, well, thanks for the opportunity. Well, maybe the website is www.extremeselfprotection.com. Dot com. That's all one word and spelled exactly like it sounds, ExtremeSelfProtection.com. By the way, I didn't make up that name when I first started as a producer throwing me on it, but hey, I, I, I take it. No, I'm not going to change the domain name at this point. You can go there, take a look at all the products if you want. Uh, if uh, you had any questions about what we've done there, you can hit the contact info in there. Drop me an email or drop me a Facebook message. Hell, you can call me if you want. I just tell people I live on Eastern Standard Time. As long If you're calling me, make it between 9 to 6 p.m. in the day. And I'll talk to you unless I'm, you know, on the road or something like that. Uh, or, you know, hit our free newsletter to find out what nonsense we've got coming out, what new products are coming out. As you just said, we've got something new coming out every single month. Always free video clips out there. Always a new article being written because they can't shut the hell up. So uh, basically that's at www.extremeselfprotection.com. We'll get you hooked up. Excellent, Mark. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on and taking time out of your schedule to be with us today. I really appreciate it. And for the audience, uh, this is not going to be the last we hear from Mark. We plan on having him back for several conversations. So I got to say to you, hey, hey, tell you what, man, appreciation is a two-way street. Thank you.